Chapter 5 Six little sailor boys playing with a high A bumblebee stung one And then there were five My compliments to Miss Claythorne and Mr. Bloor for breakfast. We have to eat to keep our strength up. I'm a domestic sort of man. I don't mind. Since it is now certain the killer is following the rhyme over the fireplace in the front parlor, our course is clear. Miss Brent, you have an allergy to bee stings. The next little sailor boy is meant to lose his life in the same way. We will do our utmost to protect you. I have something I'd like to say, since Mr. Owen is undoubtedly here in this room, keeping his strength up. The others may have done what your recording claimed, but I am not guilty of anything. Beatrice Taylor died of her own sins, not by my hand. I feel certain you now see you were in error when you invited me here to face your judgment. That's a nervy speech, if you ask me. I was just doing my job. Miss Brent, you cannot assume Owen is behaving rationally in any way. If you'd seen what he did to Rogers, Doctor, I will thank you to keep your opinions to yourself. Coming from the bottom of a bottle as they do, they are worse than useless. How dare you! I'm sure Mr. Owen and I understand one another. I'm going to collect my knitting. I'll be on the front patio if anyone needs me. I can't see anyone needing that woman, ever. If you'll excuse me, I'll just go up to my room and fresh... That is to say... I must say, Mr. Narakot, I'm disappointed. Four dead now. My confidence in you seems to have been misplaced. I may have to take more direct action. There's been a murder. Surely I should use this time to thoroughly search for clues. Six little sailor boys. This is getting worrisome. Can't be much fun playing alone. The doctor seems uninterested in snooker at the moment. Besides, I find the game relaxes me. I can think more clearly. I'm sorry you think I let you down. Not at all, my boy. My criticism was for Mr. Owen's benefit. I see no reason to put all of my eggs in one basket, then show the contents of that basket to him. I'm working along several lines at the moment. I'll give you a game. I'd rather continue on my own if you don't mind. Besides, you have more important things to do, I'm sure, than knock a few balls into holes. Do you have any suggestions for me? It's the first decent weather we've had since yesterday morning. I'd take advantage of that to signal the mainland or try and escape the island. Thank you kindly, Judge. You had no right to speak to me that way at breakfast. Didn't I? It's still morning and you're drunk already. Thanks to you. Doctor, as you yourself must know, blaming others for one's own faults is a favorite trick of the alcoholic. You cloak yourself in religion, but you're the most unchristian woman I've ever met. You're a devil. A devil, do you hear me? I'm certain everyone can hear you, Doctor. Eavesdropping is impolite, Mr. Narakot, but under the circumstances, I'm glad you overheard. Enjoying the break in the weather, Miss Brent. This island has only two types of weather, gloomy and slightly less gloomy. I am taking advantage of this brief, slightly less respite. 
You were pretty hard on Dr. Armstrong. No more than he deserved. I only wonder that he didn't kill more people operating drunk than that one woman Owen mentioned. Please, was it? Armstrong was trying to help you at breakfast. I do not require his help, or yours. The Lord is mindful of his own. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror at night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. You are the next logical victim, Miss Brett. I disagree. Owen's bee sting might be many things. One of my knitting needles, perhaps. Even a hypodermic needle. I suspect the doctor has one of those in his medical bag. Besides, I'm confident that the angel of death will pass me over. Anything else that might be important? I can't vouch for its importance, but something rather annoying has happened. What? Someone has taken my grey wool. All of it. I won't be able to finish this shawl without it. Good day, Miss Brent. You just keep your distance. I'm not your enemy. That's as may be, but I'm trusting no one. Did you discover anything? Perhaps I did, but I think I'll keep it to myself if you don't mind. You'll get no more out of me. Her moods are as changeable as the weather. You keep away from her. Relax, old boy. For some reason, the lady seems to prefer you. I seem to have underestimated you. I wonder if Owen has too. Are you okay, Vera? 
Yes, I'm fine. I just don't know who to trust. You can trust me. So you say. All right, I've had it. I need to find a way off this island once and for all. And the sooner the better. Can't say I'm ecstatic about this enterprise, but here goes nothing. I didn't even come close to the mainland. Lucky that buoy was out there or I'd have drifted out to sea. There was a metal box affixed to it, quite recently from all appearances. It looked like some sort of homing beacon. Blast! I'm beginning to think this island is impossible to leave. I'd best return to the house to dry off before I catch my death. I don't want to do Owen's work for him. Quickly, someone! Miss Brent was screaming. It sounded like it came from the apiary. I'd better get moving. Those welts on her face. A horrible way to die. Will you gentlemen carry her back to her room? I don't feel quite myself. Six little sailor boys playing with a hive. A bumblebee stung one and then there were five. Another rhyme fulfilled. But why? Why? Surely you don't believe all that rot about her innocence. No, but she was rightfully afraid of bees. Why would she come out here of all places? Maybe Owen carried her. From the front patio? In broad daylight? How could he be certain no one would see? And it'll take both of us to carry her back. There is something no one's thought of. What if Owen has an accomplice? Chapter 6. Five little sailor boys going in for law. One got in chancery, and then there were four. One more of us acquitted too late. So she wasn't passed over after all. I could have told her that wasn't likely to happen. It's almost more than I can bear to stay in the house. Five gone now. Five lying in their rooms under those sheets. 
cold. Forever cold now. Steady on, Vera. We can't lose our grip now. Bleak House by Charles Dickens is a scathing indictment of the Chancery Court until it was merged with the common law courts in 1873 at its worst cases of estates and inheritances could carry on for the entire lifetimes of those involved. To get caught in Chancery Court literally might have meant one could die there. I can't help but feel that Mr. Owen has that particular fate reserved for me. My time would appear to have come. Miss Brent refused protection, at least what mortal hands could provide. Will you, Judge? Not at all. I welcome it. My days on this earth may be few at this point. All the more reason I relish every one. But it was the participants in the cases whom the Chancery Court often crushed, not the judges. An interesting point, Miss Claythorne. I'll certainly have to think that over. There is another point I'd like to make. There usually is. One of us is a murderer. Everything must be done to safeguard the four of us who are innocent. Mr. Lombard, you have a gun. I'll be damned if I'll give up my revolver. Happily, there are enough of us still alive to force the issue if necessary. Oh, very well, then, since you've got it all taped out. It's in the drawer of the table by my bed. I'll get it. I'll just keep you company if you don't mind. How are you holding up, Vera? I'll be fine as soon as Philip returns. Any idea why Miss Brent might have gone to the apiary? Even with her belief in divine intervention on her behalf, I don't see her going there of her own free will. Thank you for your time, Miss Claythorne. What can we do to best protect you, Judge? We must protect each other. Miss Claythorne is right. It may be only my ego insisting I'm the next victim. Even if I am, Owen is running out of time. Your brother is certain to raise the alarm if you don't return tomorrow. That means a boat, weather providing. Owen still has much to accomplish before then. If I'm guarded, he may well pass me over. Perhaps drop his little rhyming schemes entirely. The innocent among us are all equally at risk. What's your opinion about how Miss Brent got to the apiary? That one point has been worrying me like a bit of beef stuck between my teeth. It seems obvious to me that she wasn't carried. She was lured there. How, I don't know. But it had to be by the one person amongst us she would trust implicitly. But who would that be? I'm afraid my deliberations have come to focus on you, Miss Claythorne. If you gentlemen will excuse me. Vera, you shouldn't be alone. As long as Philip and Mr. Blore are together, and you three remain together, I'm perfectly safe. Good evening, Judge. How are you holding up, Doctor? What? Oh, fine, fine. Never better. What can you tell me about Miss Brent's death? Multiple bee stings. Severe allergic reaction. She never stood a chance. Any idea how she got out to the apiary? Walked, I expect. Oh, I see what you mean. Not the place I'd choose for a stroll if I was allergic. Must have been lured somehow. Or coerced. If you'll excuse me, Doctor. Snooker, Doctor? I'm not sure I could give you much of a game. Hands. Hands are a little shaky. But I'll try if you like. Excellent.
was in that table, I tell you. I'm going to search you whether you like it or not. You fool! Can't you see the lock's been forced? Narakot, will you help me search him? I won't resist. Nothing. Now it's your turn. Not even a stray bee. And you, Mr. Narakot? Go right ahead. Nothing. That leaves Armstrong, the judge, or Miss Claythorne. The killer could have simply hidden it somewhere. I'm going to search everyone anyway. And if it's hidden, I'll find it. And I'm starting in here, if Mr. Lombard has no objections. Help yourself. Try not to make too much of a mess. There's no Rogers anymore to clean up. to my thoughts. Well, Doctor? A dangerous game. If it fails... Ah, Mr. Narakot. Any luck finding the revolver? None. Mr. Bloor has searched us, and I heard Miss Claythorne yelling at him to watch his hands earlier, so I suspect she's been searched as well. The murderer has had plenty of time to devise a hiding place. I don't fancy it will be easily found. If you'll excuse us, we'll continue our game. What's this? There's something written on the bottom of Narakot's plate. So lib a mind. So lib a mind. My dear sir, that is a deadly poison. Owen has undoubtedly poisoned you. Is there an antidote? Yes, turpentine oil, but I have none in my bag. I don't feel anything yet. How long do I have? You won't feel anything until, um, until you can't feel anything. You have an hour or so, I'd estimate. No more. I say, turpentine oil can be found in Bellman's Universal Embrication, a patent medicine for rheumatism and minor aches and pains. I never prescribe it. It can cause a nasty rash if over-applied. But there may be some in the house. Beastly night again. I can't see why anyone would want to build a house here. With war coming on, it may be useful as a coastal watch post. The generator again. No one's going out in that school to repair it this time. Obviously the waiting is over. Mr. Owen has made his next move. We mustn't let our guards down. Only one of us can be alone. The rest must always stay together until that person returns. 
May I claim that privilege, Judge? I'd like to go get my wrap. Of course, my dear, but don't be long. I shan't. Do you really think there'll be a war, Judge? I don't see it myself. One world war should have shown any sensible person the folly of such a course. My dear doctor, if there's one thing I believe Mr. Hitler is not, it is a sensible person. That was Vera screaming. I think it was coming from her bedroom. There's a wind coming from Vera's room. That sounded like it came from the dining room. He's been shot. Death must have been instantaneous. The figures! Look at the centerpiece. They say trouble comes in threes. It would appear that they're correct. First poison, then the generator, then the poor judge. I'm not feeling so well. I should try and do something about it. The petrol tank is now full. Maricott, leave the investigation to me right now and find yourself an antidote. Sir, I again must say in my medical opinion, Bellman's universal embrication is your best chance to counteract the poison.
Hello, what's this? That did the trick. I feel much better now. Chapter 7. Four little sailor boys going out to sea. A red herring swallowed one, and then there were three. Four bodies upstairs, two down. Can't be very hygienic. Still with us, Naricot? Solidamide isn't much of a poison, if you ask me. Although your face is all flushed. I found the antidote. Thank heavens! The weather is moderate. Might be a chance for a bonfire on Ship's Rock. Can you give an account of your movements? I followed you and Lombard almost to the top of the stairs. I heard someone below me breathing in the dark. So I stays as still as a church mouse. Then I hear stealthy steps heading down the stairs. This stands investigating, I think. So I creep as carefully as I can back down. I stepped closer and saw the doctor bending over Wargrave. Did you see the gun anywhere? No, but I smelled the cordite from it in the air. One thing I don't understand, that wig on the judge's head. Where did that come from? Someone borrowed Miss Brent's grey yarn. She told me it was missing. She was extremely perturbed. Something finally broke through that icy shell of hers, eh? I didn't think it was possible. Owen certainly thinks ahead. Who arrived in the dining room after you? Lombard, practically on my heels. Then a few seconds later, Miss Claythorne opened the kitchen door. I found that peculiar. You said you knew something about the history of this island. It was bought by that sailing chap, Elmer Robson. But his wife got seasick, poor dear. Loved the bird watching, but not the boating. An American film star named Gabrielle Steele bought it from them after some scandal or other back in the States. She stuck it out for a couple of years, but must have missed the glamour and excitement of Hollywood because she packed it in. Next, the Admiralty was rumoured to have taken it over for some super secret stuff I could never get a line on. The thing that puzzled me was that I found no record of anybody named Owen buying the place. I was going to get on to his solicitor, Archibald Morris, before coming, but he died last week. Died? What was the cause? Still under investigation, but it sounded like poison to me. That'll do, Mr. Bloor. Cause of death was a bullet? Yes, directly in the center of his forehead. Never had a chance. Can you give an account of your movements? When we heard Miss Claythorne scream, I naturally went with the rest to investigate. I thought the judge was right behind me. I stood there for a moment, wondering whether I should go up or down. While I was there, I heard the shot. I made my way back to the dining room. He was quite dead. Did you see the gun? No. Who arrived in the dining room after you? Mr. Bloor, I believe. Yes, then Lombard, and finally Miss Claythorne. From the kitchen. I didn't understand that. Good evening, Doctor. What happened after you went upstairs? I went to my room, opened the door. A gust of wind blew my candle out. I tried to move toward the French doors to close them when... It felt like a hand on my face. Cold, clammy, smelling of the sea. I thought of Cyril, floating down through the green depths. Oh, Vera. I screamed and ran, stumbling in the dark. I found myself at the service hallway, heard running behind me and rushed in there. Then I made my way down the back stairs every time there was a flash of lightning. There was a shot while I was on the stairs. I went through the kitchen to the dining room. I was the last to arrive. The clammy hand was seaweed hanging from a line. I had a look inside after we... Uh, made the judge comfortable. Just a length of seaweed. Well, whoever strung it up, combined with the generator failing, made a neat diversion designed to separate us. Did you see the gun anywhere? No, I'm sorry. Can you give an account of your movements? 
Just for the record, Wargrave was the one so keen on you playing detective, not me. It didn't turn out so well for him, did it? You won't answer my questions. I didn't say that. Just thought it worth pointing out. My movements? I ran up the stairs behind you and, well, I ducked into the bathroom at the top. The one Armstrong and the judge share. Uh, share. Curious behavior. It occurred to me that Vera's scream was meant to be a diversion. I wanted to see what everyone would do. In the lightning flashes, I saw Bloor head back down the stairs. Narakop was along the hall there. So I went downstairs to the dining room, arriving behind Bloor. Did you see the gun anywhere? I saw it in a flash of lightning and scooped it up. I didn't know what had happened then. I realize now you have only my word that I picked it up after the murder. I think you'd better hand that over. I think you'd better not try to take it away from me again. Who arrived in the dining room after you? Vera appeared in the kitchen doorway a few moments later. Are you sure you recognized Owen's voice? All right, Narakot, I'll tell you. I was hired by Archibald Morris, the non-existent Mr. Owen's attorney. He first made contact with me over the telephone. With Morris's voice on the recording, I'd swear to it. That'll be all, Mr. Lombard. Five left. And we don't know which. I know. I haven't the least doubt. I suppose I do know, really. I think I've got a pretty good idea now. I haven't a clue. I don't know about the rest of you lot, but I'm going to go to my room and lock myself in until daylight. Sound plan. I agree. But Patrick doesn't have a room. Plenty of them about, if he doesn't mind sharing. Five bullets are plenty. Oh, Hugo. I'm so sorry. Self-righteous, smug old hypocrite. Letting Narakot play his detective games with a real professional on the case. He got no more than he deserved. Were you upstairs just now? No. One of them's out of his or her room. Whoever it was went out the front door. I'll follow. Find out who's missing. That's our killer. I need to check everyone's room and find out who's missing. Last of the Borgias, starring Gabrielle Steele. Never had the pleasure. The Queen's Handmaiden, Gabrielle Steele. I find her style slightly histrionic. Ah! The movies! Film is running, but nothing's being projected. Locked. There's a card and a film reel in here. This could use a closer look. There's a film reel and a handwritten note in here. This bears a closer look.
A Gabrielle Steele film? No thanks, I'd rather not watch that tripe. A Gabrielle Steele film? No thanks, I'd rather not watch that tripe. The film has been spooled. Looked like a home movie of some sort. Wargrave's body is missing. Interesting development. One I'd better keep to myself for the moment. Patrick, Bloor heard someone. They ran outside. I'm checking to see who's still here. Better to let the dead rest in peace.
I have nothing more to say to her. Better to let the dead rest in peace. The body was thoroughly searched. No need to disturb it now. Nerakot. Someone has left the house. Bloor's following whoever it is. Well, it isn't me. I don't think she's in the mood for conversation. me his gun. It's me, Patrick. Where did he go? He wanted me to tell you. Since the wind dropped, he was going to try and light the bonfire. That's a good idea, but he shouldn't try it alone. Then go help him. I'll be safe locked in here with his gun.
quite a signifier. Someone should be able to see it. Did you find Armstrong? No, he's disappeared. We searched everywhere. Have you and Lombard been together all this time? Yes, I found him up on Ship Rock. Thanks, Bloor. Did you stay in your room the entire time? Yes, I'm not a complete fool. Did you hear or see anything? Nothing, after I told you where Philip had gone. Until just now, when he and Mr. Bloor returned. Thank you for your time, Miss Claythorne. What did you do before Bloor found you? Crept along the balcony to Vera's window and gave her my gun. Very generous. Then I went up onto Ship Rock. I set the bonfire ablaze, but someone will have to keep an eye on it throughout the night. Any sign of Armstrong? He's vanished clean off the island. Vanished, that's the word. Like some damned conjuring trick. He must be somewhere. No, he isn't. We searched the house, too. You must have heard us. He's gone. Clean vanished. Scarpered. That'll be all, Mr. Lombard. Have you looked in the dining room? No. What is it? What is it now? Only three sailor boys are left. Chapter 8. Three little sailor boys walking in the zoo. A big bear hugged one, and then there were two. Three little sailor boys walking in the zoo. I've been all over this island more than once, and I've yet to see a bear. We should stay together in one room. I still have the gun. Wouldn't we be safe then? Possibly. Provided you aren't Owen. We can't. One of us has to keep the signal fire on Ship Rock going. And there's something else. Armstrong isn't the only one of us to have vanished. The rest of us are here. Those still alive, yes. Wargrave's body is missing. Huh. I have to admit, not much seems to get past you, Narakot. Oh, how ghastly! We'd better find it. Vera is safe enough locked in her room with the gun. Law, if you and Narakot search for Wargrave... You mean for his body? Um, yes, if you like. I'll keep the bonfire going. There's only one path up to Shiprock. If I keep an eye on that and have a flaming torch close at hand, I should be fine. I've got this. I'll be alright. I'm going to find Wargrave. Would you gentlemen mind escorting me to my room? My pleasure. Fine, Lombard. I'll start looking for Wargrave, too. Oh, Patrick.
dead as Hamlet's dad, but not shot, and the body is still warm. Floor. Looks like his head is caved in. What is it? I heard a cry. It's Bloor. His head's been smashed in by a marble clock in the shape of a bear. Oh, but there was one on my... Wait there a moment. It was on my mantle. When Philip escorted me to my room, it must have been already gone. One of you, Philip, or you. Wait. Dr. Armstrong, dead for hours, and by the looks of him, he's been in the sea most of that time. Chapter 9. Two little sailor boys sitting in the sun. One got frizzled up, and then there was one. Don't try to get in. I'm pointing the gun at the door. I'm not the killer! You're trying to make me believe Philip is the killer. Armstrong's dead, his body washed up on the rocks, and Wargrave is sitting in the screening room, dead, again. That's impossible! I swear it! This time he was bludgeoned with the law book he wrote. I think that's how he was originally meant to die. The next rhyme. Two little sailor boys sitting in the sun. One got frizzled up. That means we'll be safe till morning, doesn't it? No one can be frizzled up at night. No tricks, Narakot, or I'll light you up like Guy Fawkes. 
Lombard, listen to me. Bloor is dead. Armstrong's dead. So is Wargrave. You're next. You have to be. That may be your plan, but it won't work. There's no way Owen can approach you without being seen. Correct? As we're proving right now. So it must be some sort of trap. Already set before you came up here. What sort of trap? The Rhyme! Two little sailor boys sitting in the sun. One got frizzled up. The only thing approaching the sun on this island right now is that fire. Get away from it! I like a good explosion as much as the next fellow, but not when I'm the target. I owe you an apology, Narakat. And my thanks for saving my life. Believe me, I wasn't sure. You out of everyone had been responsible for the most deaths. Your detecting skills played you false there, old boy. You see, I'm not Philip Lombard. My name is Charles Morley. Got papers to prove it, too. Bill was a friend of mine. He committed suicide a couple of weeks ago. I was at his place when the solicitor Morris rang up. It sounded suspicious. I thought it might have something to do with Phil's death. I wanted to get to the bottom of it, so I came along in his place. Besides, a hundred guineas is a hundred guineas. So you're no murderer? I'll confess I've thought of murdering you more than once the past few days. Listen, Lombard. Uh, Morley. I need to ask you a terrific favor. You've earned the right. Can you play dead for a while? Stay out of sight. Vera must be the killer. The jury's still out as far as I'm concerned. But if Owen thinks you're out of the way, he may try for me. Or Vera, if she's innocent. Which is why I have to get back to the house. Say, old man, if you want to get into the house without making a racket, the window to my bathroom is open. I used it to get out on the balcony and, uh... Make sure Vera was safe. Uh-huh. Okay, thanks for the tip. Will you lie low? Come running if there's trouble. It'll be a pleasure to return the favor, old man. Chapter 10. One little sailor boy left all alone. He went and hanged himself, and then there were none. I hear a voice. No, voices. They're coming from upstairs. I've always had a duplicate set of keys, Miss Claythorne, as a former and actually the current owner of this house. You own this house? I have for several years. I saw to it that Emily Brent died two weeks ago. I took her place for the weekend. My finest performance, I think. Worthy of the Oscar the Academy always refused me. But the bee stings! Hurt like hell, and did nothing for my complexion. But Emily Brent was allergic, not me. It's my apiary, after all. Who are you? My name is Gabrielle Steele. You've seen my posters in the screening room. The actress? Some scandal in Hollywood. Scandal? Well, I guess if you call trying to kill your leading man a scandal, yes, it was. My final picture, last of the Borgias. Something happened. Lillian Borgia, the character I portrayed. One day on the set, suddenly she... She was inside my head. She wormed her way in. That's the only way I can think to explain it. Telling me to do things. Showing me how. They called it a breakdown. I now like to think of it as a meeting of two minds. But why this elaborate plot? Why kill all these people? Why? Wargrave, of course. He was absolutely right. He was the central character in our little drama. The Edward Seaton trial? 
Yes, Edward Seaton. My love. My life. We met some years ago when I first came to London to star in a play in the West End. Then, after the incident in Hollywood, I came back to England to rest. They wanted me to rest. Edward and I fell in love. I cannot describe to you the depth of our love. You wouldn't understand. I've seen how you flirted with Lombard and Narricot, playing them off against one another. Did I? I was frightened and, and confused. I suppose that's as good an explanation as any. I was never confused. Edward was an innocent man, railroaded by that venomous old judge, simply to prove a point. That it was his courtroom, his law. Three days Edward suffered. He couldn't bear the shame or what it would do to me. He killed himself for me. I wanted Wargrave to suffer those three days, watching as death approached, powerless to prevent it. But why the rest of us? I met Miss Brent at a resort soon after I arrived in England. Hateful old hag. I think I caught her qualities quite nicely. I heard how she had punished Beatrice Taylor for her so-called sin. Drove her to take her own life, just as Wargrave had driven Edward to suicide. I wanted to extend Wargrave's torture for three excruciating days. What better way than to make him watch others die? Crimes committed under his very nose. Deaths he was helpless to prevent. How his ego must have been scraped raw. You researched? Found us all? Others who had apparently escaped justice like Miss Brent. With the help of my attorney, Archibald Morris. How could he agree to help with such a mad plan? Mad? Madmen kill for no reason, no sense of justice at all. I only killed those who deserved to die. And Morris was a perfect little lawyer, asking no questions as long as the money was good. He'd been responsible for a few miscarriages of justice on his own, so killing him was not a serious moral dilemma. Then the stage was set. We arrived on my island, and the play began. The trickiest part was goading Armstrong into getting so drunk he wouldn't notice the imperceptible pulse that remained after I took the Karari. A few bee stings and then a liberal application of Bellman's universal embrocation to complete the effect. It causes a nasty rash. He saw what he expected to see, a severe allergic reaction that can only result in death. You killed the judge twice? Hardly. The first time was some fool scheme he cooked up on his own with Armstrong, so he could pretend to be dead and catch Mr. Owen. I admit stealing Miss Brent's grey yarn and fashioning a wig from it was a nice touch. I was so angry. I couldn't think who had done it or why. I thought braining him with his own law book would be enough to fit the chancery rhyme. If you shoot me, you'll be arrested. Patrick will catch you. I'll deal with Mr. Narricot presently. Then I'll take poison. This ring I wear is a prop, from the Borgia movie. Came in very handy this weekend. First for Marston, then Ethel, then my own Karari. And now, here we are. Once I'm dead, you can hang yourself and complete the rhyme. And if I refuse to hang myself? My dear, what do you think will happen to you if you're the only person found alive on an island with ten dead bodies? If you don't hang yourself, the law most certainly will. Thank you, Charles. That's right. If you ever need a break from Narricot, Charles Morley is in the London Directory. Treat her right, Narricot. As far as I'm concerned, you're a better man in a tight spot than Phil ever was. This little sailor boy isn't going near the sea for a long time to come. Will you listen to me now? If you insist. Hugo and Cyril went down to the beach early that day. By the time I arrived, Cyril was out too far. It was too late to reach him. Hugo claimed he had been distracted, helping a passerby with directions. I knew how it would look. I thought I loved him. So I told the coroner's inquest that it was I who had been on the beach. Later, when I was cleared, Hugo was jubilant. 
Yet his feelings for me seemed to have vanished. I realized I had served my purpose. How would it have looked if the boy who stood between him and a fortune died while in his charge? He didn't think he'd done anything wrong. That was the most frightening part. Cyril wanted to swim out to the rocks. All Hugo did was let him. Mr. Owen invited the wrong guest. It should have been Hugo out there. No. I should have told the police the truth in the first place. I will now. I have no more right to subvert justice than Mr. Owen. Where is your brother? Plymouth, turning himself in. Thanks to your and Lombard, uh, Morley's statements, he's sure to be exonerated. And us? Are you still confused? No. I'm certain now. What about you? Well, there's another ending to that ten little sailor boys rhyme. One little sailor boy left all alone. He got married, and then there were none. Silence, please. I have prepared a special reward for you. The original ending to our little story is somewhat different than the one you have just experienced. If you can complete a final puzzle, childishly simple really, you will be able to learn the original solution to And Then There Were None, as Dame Agatha Christie first wrote it. Interested? Then your first step is to make your way to the dining room for a final treat. The Last Little Sailor Boy been spooled. From my earliest youth, I realized that my nature was a mass of contradictions. I have an incurably romantic imagination, and it was for this reason that I adopted a rather childish and unreliable approach, writing my confession, enclosing it in a bottle, and casting it into the waves. There is a hundred to one chance that this confession may be found. And then a hitherto unsolved murder mystery will be explained. Another trait born of my contradictory nature is my sadistic delight in causing death. From an early age, I knew very strongly the lust to kill. And yet, I was also indoctrinated with a strong sense of justice. I have always felt that the innocent should be spared and the guilty punished. With this mental makeup, it was inevitable that I would adopt the law as my profession. After ascending to the bench, I found that most of my baser desires were quenched in a legal and just way. And yet of late, I have felt a nagging urge, one that will not free me from its insistent grip. That is the urge to commit a murder myself. I fancied myself an artist in crime, and my imagination whacked secretly to this colossal force. However, I was restrained by my innate sense of justice. The innocent must not suffer. And then quite suddenly, the solution came to me. I would punish those that the law could not touch. In my years on the bench, there were many cases that frustrated my will. Cases wherein I knew the accused to be guilty, 
and yet the evidence was such that he could never be convicted. Cases of deliberate murder that were quite untouchable within the confines of the law. So I determined to commit not just one murder, but murder on a grand scale. A childish rhyme of my infancy came back to me. The rhyme of the ten little sailor boys. Something about it fascinated me. The inexorable diminishment. The sense of inevitability. And so I began, secretly, to collect victims. I will not go into detail about how this was accomplished. Suffice to say, I was convinced of the guilt of every one of my victims, and I knew enough about them via my connections to be able to lure each one to Shipwreck Island with an appropriate bait. And now to the mechanics of the actual crime. In what I took as a sign, none of my plans misfired, and all of my guests arrived at Shipwreck Island on the 8th of August. The party included myself. The order of the deaths were dictated by what I viewed as my victims' varying degrees of guilt. Those whose guilt was lightest should go first, and not suffer the increasing mental strain and fear reserved for the more cold-blooded offenders. The first death had already occurred. Archibald Morris, a shady little dope peddler, had set up the details for me, renting the island, sending the letters, and recording the gramophone record before I ended his life with a dose of potassium cyanide. Anthony Marsden and Mrs. Rogers died next, one instantaneously, the other in a peaceful sleep. Marsden's crime was one of circumstance, and his amoral nature Mrs. Rogers, I had no doubt, acted largely under the influence of her husband. Their murders were the easiest. Poison easily slipped into a glass for each of them, as at this point no one had any reason to be suspicious. General Mackenzie met his death quite painlessly and never heard me approach. I am convinced that he was dead long before he ever came to Shipwreck Island. At this point, I found it necessary to recruit an ally. Dr. Armstrong seemed the most suited to this task, as it was inconceivable to him that a man of my standing could be a murderer. He was taken in with no resistance. I killed Rogers on the morning of the 10th. He, too, did not hear me approach. During the chaos arising from finding his body, I slipped into Lombard's room and abstracted his revolver. At breakfast, I slipped my last dose of poison into Miss Brent's coffee. It was enough to render her unconscious, and I returned a short time later to inject a strong dose of cyanide into her. It was just after this that I intimated to Armstrong that we must carry our plan into effect, that I must appear to be the next victim. This would, perhaps, rattle the murderer, and at any rate, would allow me to move about the house and spy on whom I wished. A gunshot and some red mud on the forehead was all it took. After all, it was only Armstrong who examined me closely. After returning the revolver to Lombard's room, I had a rendezvous set up with Armstrong on the edge of a cliff. He was still quite unsuspicious, although he ought to have been warned by the nursery rhyme, a red herring swallowed one. Once at the cliff, I uttered an exclamation, leaned over the cliff. Wasn't that the mouth of a cave? He leaned right over. A swift push sent him quickly into the heaving sea below. He took the red herring all right. And now came the moment I had anticipated. Three people who were so frightened of each other that anything might happen. And one of them had a revolver. I watched them from the windows of the house. When Bloor came up alone, 
I had the big marble clock poised ready. Exit. Blore. From my window, I saw Vera shoot Lombard. I always thought she was a match for him and more. I then immediately set the stage in her bedroom. It was an interesting experiment. Would the knowledge of her own guilt, the hypnotic suggestion of her surroundings, and the nervous tension of having just shot a man be enough to coerce her into taking her own life? It was. Vera Claythorne hanged herself before my very eyes as I stood in the shadow of the wardrobe. And now I shall finish writing this. I shall enclose it and seal it in a bottle and throw the bottle into the sea. Why? Yes. Why? I suppose I have a pitiful human wish that someone should know just how clever I have been. I must go now and finish this. It is essential that my body be found in accordance with the record kept by my fellow victims. My own life is of no consequence. My doctors tell me I have a month to live at most. I do not wish to die the death of the invalid patient, steeped to the gills in drugs, culminating in a complete loss of human dignity. I will instead be found laid neatly in my bed, shot through the forehead. When the sea goes down, there will come from the mainland boats and men, and they will find ten dead bodies and an unsolved problem on Shipwreck Island. Signed, Lawrence Wargrave.